you. Uh, so welcome uh, everyone. Um, so as mentioned, we'll talk about the uh, community data analysis and bringing it back to KDE um, because it turns out that's something we used to do and then stopped and I picked up the torch. Uh, so my name is Kevin Otens. Uh, I'm working for uh, KDAB uh, to pay the bills. Uh, and so I'm doing uh, cute consulting, uh, trainings, development uh, as a trade. And on my spare time, I'm uh, working for the KD community. I've been doing that for a long while. Uh, lately, I'm not churning much code in KD products, uh, but turns out that through that topic, I'm churning a bit of code uh, about the community itself. So let's get back in time first. Do you Maybe some of you know or remember that guy, right? Uh, look at that guy, he looks dashing, right? Uh, what a teddy bear, right? Uh, you want to hug him. And hug him we did, right? We've been hugging him for a long time. Uh, and you probably know him not for the code he produced, uh, because he didn't write any code for the KD community, really. Uh, but he had a couple of scripts which he didn't publish until fairly recently, as far as I know. Uh, and he was more uh, communicating about the results of his scripts, which were mostly this. Uh, first, uh, what he called the blue blobs uh, that you might remember. So we had one line per contributor in those ones, and then the scale uh, from left to right was uh, time and you would get a small blue blob uh, in front of contributor if that contributor was active that particular week. Right? And the more active the contributor, uh, the darker the blue blob uh, would be. It turned out when I looked at the code, and we get back to that later on, that there were basically four levels of activity. You committed once, two times, three times, or four times, and then everything else is equal after that, um, which is fairly uh, low resolution. But that was an interesting one still, right? Because from that, we could uh, see if new people were joining in uh, a particular team or the whole community. Uh, because if you have a graph which gives you a diagonal like this uh, with the blue blob starting, that means new people are coming each line, right? So that gives us an indication. That also allowed us to see uh, when someone was stopping, right? or if someone was doing a pause and then coming back. So we could would be able to see these kind of things, really. The other type of, uh, the other type of uh, diagrams he did uh, were those, right? So he did also contributor networks. Um, and so we would have one node per contributor and an edge between two contributors if those contributors collaborated, right? Um, and we determined that through uh, commits, right? That's what he did in script. Uh, if in a commit someone uh, touched a file and in another commit another person touched uh, the same file, then you would have an edge between those two. Fucking good deal. Oh, wait. Uh, between, between those two. All right, so that's a bit of an approximation of uh, collaboration, but if you're looking at the data produced by the community, which in the case of our software product is many commits, that's the best thing you can come up with, right? at least at the time. And then 2014 came, right? 2014 is basically the last time we've seen Paul at an academy. Uh, and he gave a talk where he shared something which looked like this. Well, that was a diagram where he was plotting over time the measured cohesion of the uh, community. Okay? So the higher the dot, the more cohesion we would have. So there was some noise in there, but there was a clear trend of climbing up all the way up to 2010, and then it would drop, uh, drop again. Okay? What's interesting about cohesion is that it's not related to the amount of commits you would have a particular week, right? It was related to that, how well connected that network was, how much collaboration was happening between the contributors. So that was interesting to see, to see that it was climbing up until uh, it was declining. 
the reasons why we are still debating, uh, but what I found sad is that he basically started the debate and then nothing happened, right? We didn't really start reflecting on what happened and then it kind of went the way of the dodos and we didn't look at it. Um, and recently I thought, yeah, let's see how we did it and maybe we can pick it up and we could try to make those metrics again and maybe we would get new insight because since 2014 we moved on, right? And new thing happened. Um, and so I looked at what he did and that was basically Python code uh, using git commands from within the Python uh, scripts and spitting to graphbiz, all right? That was nice, I mean, it's not all handmade uh, code, right, uh, with love and the amount of skills that Paul Adams has. If you ask him, he will tell you he's a crappy programmer. Uh, I can say I love all the code I've seen there. There were good things. Uh, some of the stuff I'm using now is still coming from there. There were a couple of problems from uh, his scripts. So they were very slow uh, and how to maintain and extend uh, because that was all really handmade. Right? Um, and the fact that he was using graphics as the output made things fairly static. So if you remember, he ended up with a PNG which was 10,000 pixels wide, right? Which is not necessarily easy to comprehend and navigate in. All right, so that's pretty much the situation all the way to 2014. And then 2018 comes, and here I am, right? Uh, here I am, and I'm thinking, okay, let's revive this and see why it can go. In 2018, you might have heard that term, um, data science, where yeah, everything is about data science nowadays, and whoa, data science is great, and we will solve every problem in the world with data science. Uh, well, yeah, uh, if I was you and sitting in that room, I would probably stand up and shout bingo at that point. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of bullshit bingo in the data science field, in my opinion, but they developed some interesting tools, all right? Um, in Python, uh, which is nice because that's what I was starting with. Uh, and I used three of them mainly, which are Pandas, Network X, and Bokeh, all right? Uh, so pandas is to be able to have vectorized view on your data and then you can actually process it in bunch instead of having your own, your own Android loop and you would have to do everything by hand. Network X is nice for dealing with contributor graphs, right? Uh, and Bokeh is nice for spitting out the visualization and that's actually dynamic HTML so you can actually navigate in there. And there is also a nice tool which is named Jupyter, uh, which allows you to churn your code faster because you can prototype and run some part of it again and see how it works. So that's what I've been looking at. And so we have a very quick demo of that. Uh, sorry, that's that one. Uh, and so Jupyter looks something like this. That's kind of an ID inside of your, uh, inside of your border then you get views on your code. I won't spend too much time commenting on the code uh, because otherwise I won't fit in uh, the 20 minutes I have. Um, but the idea is that you can split your code in snippets, right? And then run each snippet individually. So I run the first snippet. That one is longer. That's actually the part which processes uh, the Git history. So I'm looking at the world Git history of Theme uh, on the year 2017 on that snippet. And then we can start to fiddle with data. What's nice with Jupyter as well is that if you try to put one variable in one random variable, it tries best effort to actually display something meaningful, uh, which is when you have plenty of data like this, it's nice to actually check that you have a table which looks like what you expected uh, because you will get things wrong. Um, right, and then we have more of those, some more wrangling to produce the actual uh, network. All right, so some more uh, tables, and then at the end, so we have finally the bokeh rendering, and so we get these kind of graphs, right? And so, unlike what we had previously, that's actually interactive, so we can actually look in there, right? and figure out that guy that's actually Laurent Montel, right? Uh, and he's 
basically connected to almost everyone <laughs> right out there. Um, so his centrality value is fairly high because of that. Um, or we could have Dan Ratil, which has very high centrality and so on. Right? So we can do these kind of things fairly easily. And if we look at the world script, I pass a bit quickly. Now it's fairly linear, right? There's nothing, I mean, you have data in, data out, and you just do operations on that. So that's fairly maintainable in the end. And that's fairly easy to change things, right? If I would want to, for some reason, uh, it wouldn't make sense, but uh, if I would want to flip my centrality on the edge, I could just change that part and say minus one minus no centrality, right? Just uh, rerun that bit, and now I have my centrality flipped, and rerun just the rendering, right? Then I have my color scale, which is background, right? So fairly nicely, I mean, change the line, experiment, see how it looks, right? It's a very good tool for, uh, for getting there. And from that tool, then you can make scripts, and you can start produce, to produce stuff like this, right? So that one, that's uh, commit count versus team size. So by team size, we mean the number of people active a particular week. Uh, so that's actually lower than the real team size, uh, normally. Uh, so each dot corresponds to one sample for a particular week, and then the line plots are actually uh, same data, but where we uh, filter out the high frequency features, right? So to remove all the noise and get an idea of uh, of the trend. Uh, and interestingly, when I run that one on all the history, we have for KDE, which is nice because we do the work in the KDE. Uh, repositories to have the history all the way back to the beginning. We didn't lose anything, uh, as far as I know. So we have the history going back to uh, 1996. Uh, we can see that we have both the commit count and the team size growing, right, fairly consistently until 2010, and then it drops, right. Uh, interestingly, that's the same time when Paul found the difference in cohesion. Uh, I'm currently trying to reproduce that particular graph and failing so far, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but that was interesting to find the same tipping point date. Uh, and then we see it's declining, right? Um, and, and so we can see fairly interesting things happening there. So for instance, here we, we have phenomena where the team size is kind of constant. There, right? We have a plateau uh, on the team size, and during that same period, we actually see the activity climbing up crazily. And if you look back at the history, that's basically the time where we were preparing KDE4. Right? And so everyone was busy just breaking everything in KDE leaves, and so obviously that was generating lots of commits and so on with the same team. Right? So you can have great variation on that while having uh, a fixed uh, team size. Um, and, and so the point which is inconclusive and the great question for us is, why is that still declining or not? Um, and, and that's kind of a tough question and that's also, I mean, when I'm exploring those graphs, that's where most of the risk is because look at that, right? I, I mean, if you look at it, to me, it's still, uh, it's still declining if I look at it that way, all right? Now, the thing is, the way you present data actually matters, right? Because now if we don't have that big uh, drop that we had before, right, which is queuing or view, then well, it, it's not looking like something which is declining that much anymore, right? So the thing is, when you get something like this, and I, because Lydia was bashing me on the head uh, about that particular one. Uh, I actually sampled some of the data at different data points you see, uh, and that's more that view which would be relevant. Where it, it look, it's not completely stabilized yet, uh, but very clearly it's almost stabilized at that point, right? So it, it looks like, yeah, we had that big decline, but now we, almost there reaching plateau and seeing the amount of new faces I see this year, maybe we can hope things to actually climb up uh, some more from there. So that's, uh, in my opinion, actually good news. Um, interestingly, that graph is when I published it on my blog, and the one which got me most comments because everyone was outraged and about the, oh, 2010 deep and so on again. 
But that's not the most interesting stuff you can come up with, uh, in my opinion. So when I do stuff like that, no one comments on it. Lazy bastards. Uh, but the thing is, I mean, we, we can do that, right? So I revisited the blue blobs, and I remember I complained about the fact that the, I mean, resolution was fairly low in the amount of colors we had, but we can have more colors more easily than before, and so we can see that Laura Motel truly is a bot, right? Um, because, I mean, it's like outnumbering everyone every, every single week, right, of the year. It's just crazy. Uh, but then you can spot things like something happened to Volker on that particular week. I mean, he's it, been lazily churning a couple of commits here and there, and then suddenly like 130 something. Uh, that's actually the Randa effect, right? That week he was at Randa, and at Randa you churn code for cheese, right? So <laughs> he was there, right, doing stuff. Um, we can also see things like that, right? We can also look, so that's KDP again, uh, the contributor network from last year, uh, which is the one I showed with the Jupyter stuff. So we see Laurent, right? We find David, okay, he's everywhere that guy. Daniel, okay, I mean, for a comedy. Uh, Volker, yeah, okay, still active. And then there's this guy, oh, Alan Winter, right? Alan Winter, if you look at him, I mean, most of you haven't seen him, right? Most of you never hear about him or think he left the community. No, 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 he's still doing stuff in uh, KDE PIM, right? And he's still very central, right? He's uh, among the top six or five uh, central people. And then we have what's interesting about this kind of view is that you can find notes like this, like uh, Christian Molenkopf, Molenkopf, sorry, uh, who is basically acting as a bridge, right? with those three persons who are connected to no one else, right? Uh, and, and so that gives you, so if you want details about that, go to my blog, right? Uh, but that this kind of things which gives you an insight, okay, something interesting might be happening there, so let's look at that. Uh, which prompted me to do this one, which is even harder to read. Uh, that three normalized plots, uh, where you get the centrality for one contributor, you get his uh, centrality is activity over time, and the green one is the normalized team size. Because what I'm, I normalize everything there, so it's all between zero and one, because what I'm interested in is trends, not the absolute numbers, all right? Um, and the reason why we have the normalized uh, size is that we cannot really compare the centrality versus activity if the team size changes. So in that area, right, if we consider the team size somewhat stable, I mean there's no reason, right, but somewhat stable, then I can look at the variations of activity compared to, uh, to centrality, that's fine. But if I try to compare centrality there with centrality there, it doesn't mean anything because the team shrink, shrunk, right, at that point, so it doesn't make sense. And, and so the graph from Volker is actually interesting because to get his centrality up at that time, he had to be fairly, fairly active. I mean, that's like crazy level of activity from him, right? Uh, but then you get a very uh, huge spike in centrality here with a very small spike of activities. That's because the team size changed, all right? So that is kind of things uh, you can look at. And more interesting, so Christian uh, again, you look his activity is climbing while his centrality is dropping, right, for an area where the team size is kind of constant. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a sign of a uh, fork in the community, right? We have someone who is working on something that no one else is working on, right? So he started to work in his own corner. I'm not judging the reasons or whatever, right? I'm just saying that's a pattern, right? And so there might be more of those. All right. That was a quick tour of the demo part, and I'm running out of time, so I will uh, quickly conclude with what's coming next, right? When we have a few metrics and so on that we've been looking at. Well, obviously, we can look at more data sources. I mean, that's one of the requests I got. Yeah, look at the reviews. Yeah, I'd love to look at the reviews. I mean, plenty of information there. Uh, but the Fabricator API is just a bitch to get to to actually have the information. So it would require me to have a very 
big chunk of time to be able to get there, and I never managed to get that, but I would love to have that. So there are small sources we would want to look at image, same thing, but that's not that easy, right, to have complete history and so on. But that's the obvious ones, right? More metrics, more data sources, and so on. But if we do that, we're always looking at history. That's pretty much what I do there. I might, but when I look at history, I might find patterns like the one I showed before, right? And maybe we can start to do stuff with those patterns. Uh, one other thing would be, can we try to predict when someone is slowly on the way out, right? Or can we try to predict when we have patterns similar to the situation with Christian, which then would make us, or at least the community working group, proactive in figuring out that maybe something bad is happening inside of this team, right? Because right now, the community working group find the facts when it's kind of too late, right? Sometimes hard, harsh words have been uttered already. If we could get early warnings about that, then they could be proactive, and before we break the relationship, then we can, we could try to salvage it. So that's one of the things which would be interesting to do, I would love to do at some point, uh, but again, requires some time, right, like everything. Uh, the other one I have is more of a funny idea, is like having our own recommendation system. You contributed, contributed to kmail.git for the past uh, four weeks. Maybe you would be interested in checking out message list as well. <laughs> right? So for the onboarding, that would be actually something interesting to do, right? Because often uh, contributors, they get in because, well, kmail, there's this small thing I don't like, I will fix it. And then, know what? Right? We have a hard time then to have proper retention. We might easily push them toward other tasks we have uh, prepared, but maybe at the end of the day, K-Main is not necessarily the software product you would like most, and maybe you would like to look at something else, right? So if we have a way to provide some interesting recommendations for them, that could be uh, interesting. But that half a joke, that one. All right, that's pretty much what I'm looking at for the future for now. Uh, and thanks for your attention. And if you got any questions, if we still have time for that, because I'm, oh, I'm two minutes off, so we're kind of fine. So if you've got questions. Uh, you can get some questions and you have a break after that, so. Oh, we have a break after that. Yeah, 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 yeah. bring questions. Uh, Oh, yeah, before the first question, one thing I forgot to mention, there will be a buff on Monday morning, if I remember correctly, there will be a buff on Monday morning about that topic, so if you want to get in, if you want to give a hand, you can come uh, to that buff. If you have ideas of things to measure, then we can see how hard that would be and feasible or not, uh, so we can have discussions, uh, more discussions about that. But, questions? One of your conclusions that I read in your blog was that there was a lot of contributors when we switched to Git. Um, and we even argued that maybe we switched to Git too early or whatever, but we haven't really named those contributors and it has become more part of that workflow, even if you not in open source. So it is part of solving on Git, but our practice is good in it, and we look at open source and have a case that we can find a lot could be, uh, th that's the hard part. I mean, I can, that's why I actually did that one in two blog posts separately, right? Because obviously I fail because I'm still human and so on, so sometimes I slip something uh, somewhere where I shouldn't. But I try to have posts where I'm actually looking at data and trying to figure out, okay, what's going on? Kind of a cold head way of looking at things. And then having my own opinion and interpretation at distance, right? Um, and that's what I tried to do there and failed slightly. Um, so, from the time where it happened, right, so the second blog post is not only about the data, right, uh, but the data tells me that the time where it happened and, and we have a hard time to recover from that, right? So the time where it happened is actually the git switch and we have a hard time to recover from that. So that means there's two periods in there, right? The switch to git itself, and the only reason why we would have a drop like this um, with the switch to Git is because it was hard to use at the time. I mean, back, if you remember 2010, when Git was there, it was real pita to use uh, for almost everyone, right? Even seasoned developers. 
Um, and, and then there's a certain period where Git improved, GitHub, uh, GitHub appeared, everyone knows Git, and still we still have our time to recover. And then that particular area, which is one way in, well, obviously we have to speculate a bit. So I have an opinion about that, which is not necessarily true because I have nothing to really back it up, apart from my own personal experience when I get to the university and when basically, I mean, when I put students in front of Fabricator, they're like, oh, I have to create an account. I cannot identify myself with Facebook. Right, I mean, I mean that's kind of, Crap, I mean, I hate that. That's the kind of crap I have to hear, right? Uh, and, and yeah, if, if those people think that way, obviously you put them in front of something. So in that case, that wouldn't even be fabricator, really, that's identity, right? They have to create an identity, and for them, they're like, why would I do this? Right? I don't want to do this. I want to identify with GitHub or with whatever, and we don't have that option. Right? So maybe staying with Fabricator and just fixing that would be enough, who knows, right? But my personal opinion is that there's probably more from the interactions I got with them because I can force them to create an identity and then see how it goes, and they generally have more problems. So that, that's why I started to also look at other communities, uh, because at one point, I mean, the, the, the problem I, uh, I figure at some point is that I'm too close from the data, right? Uh, so uh, in some way that's normal, right? I'm doing this because I want that community to improve. So, um, but then if I want to have patterns and so on, I have to try to find them at other places. Uh, which forces me to try to know other things and so on. Uh, so one of the things I think I would try to look at is Nextcloud, because they got a fork, <laughs> right? Uh, so the fact that they got a fork uh, means it's interesting for me for that. Uh, so I will probably pull more of the data from Nextcloud, more of the data of on cloud, try to find back the period where things were happening, trying to plot things and see how it goes. So that one of the things I have on, on my mind. But yeah, definitely I need to look at more. So that's why the last one I did, Qt, DLC, uh, Rust, because I've been playing with Rust lately uh, to have different things to look at. Right? Thanks for having me so far. My question or addition is, what about young people? If I see my little daughter, 16 years old now, PC is some, using PC is some, I mean, I don't necessarily have an objection about that because, yeah, clearly it's more hip to do stuff on Android, right? I mean, uh, because they use that daily or so, on, and so they want to play with this. And, and so an option is also for us to go more aggressively on these kind of platforms. I mean, we have Kirigami and so on, so we are having actions toward that already, uh, and that's a good thing to push them, right? Um, so I have no particular objection about that, uh, but clearly, I mean, there are other factors as well, right? Uh, because uh, if you take a teen playing with a phone, yeah, obviously, I mean, be it Android or not, she probably won't contribute to it. If you take uh, a student which is in software engineering, yeah, then yes, getting into this kind of platforms could be interesting, uh, but Linux is still, interesting in some universities as well. So for those ones, there are small factors. And that's more lo those factors that I'm looking at with the historic data we have. Did you consider the side effects of bringing this information, like making it more public and more contracted in that way? Like maybe an update of this 
So by, you mean the impact I could have on the community when I publish that? Um, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> in the way, uh, I mean, in the way that it never got beyond the point of maybe that we kick their ass in doing something about onboarding, for instance. <laughs> Which is great because you're there. <laughs> so so that, that's a good thing uh, in that regard. Um, if the graph about the team size and commit was really, really, really bad, uh, I can't tell if I would have published it or not, right? The thing is, it, it gets to a territory now where it's kind of inconclusive, so that's good, right, in, in, in that way. Because if that's inconclusive, that gives a message to people that it's in your hands now, right? Uh, at the time when Paul did that in 2014, that was still very much inside of the decline. So when people are confronted with that, and I think that's why we shied away from the debate at the time, that's, oh my God, we're gonna die. Uh, and, and that's basically people being caught in the lights uh, of a car <laughs> coming quickly. Um, and, and so they basically just freeze and don't do anything about it. But we're out of that, so, so that's the thing. It's inconclusive now, it's kind of stabilized, so we can go in any direction we want, right? It's not like we have some force of nature forcing us to shrink or anything. Right, so one thing, the same file on the same time period I'm looking at, right? So if I'm looking at the time period of a week, that's if two contributors touch the same file or set of files that week. Uh, one thing I didn't mention that the link has a weight as well, so if the overlap in the files I've been touching that week is very large, then the weight of that particular edge is higher. Uh, and so then that plays in the centrality computation, that plays in the layouting of the graph. Uh, Right, we have a both on Monday morning, 10.30, if I remember for a case of anyway. So yes. that's on the wiki. Uh, I'm very clear in how great, so you can go to the internet and pick up the trades if you want. Uh, 